All right, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, November 7th. It is a Tuesday. Um, today's, today's classes, we're going to look at um, finishing up the notes on the Harding and Coolidge um, papers that we got, the guided notes that we have. Um, so today's bell, we started with this question here. With some of the knowledge of the individuals in the photograph, what goals do you think these men all had in common? Um, we looked from left to right. We have Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Warren Harding, Harvey, Harvey Firestone, and William Anderson. Firestone known for tires. Anderson is a Methodist bishop. <coughs> now, with like you probably have heard of maybe two or three of the people in this image. Based on what you know about those individuals and your prior knowledge, what do you think they all had? In, they all might have had in common. Different answers were given in class. And if you want to write your answer in your bell in your sheet, you can and just turn that in. Get ready to turn that in for Thursday this week. After we went over that, after we discussed that, we went on with our notes. We started continuing discussing Harding's domestic politics uh, or policies. Last week, I mean, excuse me, yesterday, we went over Harding's foreign policy of how he wants the state, how he wants the United States to react to foreign policy decisions that need to be made. Today, we're going to start with Harding's domestic policies. All right, Americans at this time become very nativist or are only acceptable of native-born Americans. <clears throat> this meaning that um, many, many people don't like immigrants. They don't want to see immigrants coming in. They don't want to have... Um, you know, immigration, you know, as large as it is, because immigration causes a lot of the problems in society. At least that's what people, you know, point the finger at. <clears throat> Nativism grows out of several reasons, uh, patriotism, religion, urban conditions, jobs, and also from the Red Scare. Each of these has, an, uh, has their own, like, description behind it. Um, you know, patriotism, obviously, people, uh, they're, they're big on the you know, United States of America, red, white, and blue, you know, stars and stripes. Um, anyone who comes outside of it obviously does not have the same patriotism as they do, so they're going to use that to separate themselves. A religion is another reason they, off, they offer to separate, because a lot of the people coming into the United States have a different faith than what Americans have currently. The, the base religion in America is Protestant ends of um, Christianity. Um, a lot of the immigrants coming in either were not Christian, or if they were Christian, they were forms of Catholic, Catholicism. Um, uh, Irish and Italian immigrants specifically made up the Catholic sectors of people that came in at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, urban conditions also helped lead to a lot of the major problems that people thought was wrong with the cities, and many people blamed it on the immigrants, because when the immigrants moved in, they moved right to the cities, and those conditions in the cities are attributed to them living there, the immigrants. Again, pointing the finger at something because we want to have something to blame. That's what nativism comes out of. The jobs are scarce for many native-born Americans because they expect a lot of pay. They have a lot of expectations <clears throat> that come in here when we look at the United States um, and, and what the standard of living is at. Many immigrants are willing to get paid below what that normal standard of living is, is what would allow. Um, so many Americans get really frustrated with immigrants in that way. And then also the Red Scare, we talked about uh, Thursday, Friday last week. Um, what, what kind of, you know, with, with this Red Scare, many Americans are afraid that immigrants are going to do the country harm. They're going to come and be spies. They're going to, you know, set up set off bombs in public places you know there's just this innate fear that the reds because of the red scare because of these actions by courtrooms and trials that it was just not going to um you know, there were going to be a lot of you know people that were going to want to do the country harm so immigrants are hated or, or disliked for that reason so harding establishes a quota system for immigration to kind of cater to these nativist ideas <clears throat> especially what would happen is uh you would take the past census find a nationality let's say it was swedish if you take the Swedish population of the United States that currently exists right now, you take that number and then only take 3% of that in new immigrants. So, for instance, let's say there's 2 million Swedish immigrants living in America at this time. They would only allow 60,000 new immigrants into the United States for that year. That's the quota system. So if they go over, that's it. They cut it off. If they go under, they just keep accepting new, new and more and more and more. And then they just, every 10 years, they create a new census and that's what they're going to take. So... You know, for, for 10 years, you're going to take 60,000 um, Swedish immigrants per year, which is not a lot. Um, so it helps to limit immigration, which definitely caters to a lot of those nativist beliefs. <clears throat> Harding is also domestic policies. He wasn't a huge proponent of African-American rights, but at the same time, he proposed some laws promoting African-American civil rights. Um, he, he was quoted in a speech saying that, you know, African-Americans have every right to, to be contributing members of this society. And he gives this speech... Um, when he makes this quote to a Birmingham, Alabama crowd, many of the African Americans in attendance were cheering while a lot of the white um, patrons that showed up to listen to Harding speak were kind of upset and kind of astonished as to a president actually saying that, trying to promote the rights of African Americans, which was, which was a very foreign concept in Alabama at that time, and it still continued to be a very foreign concept in Alabama throughout the next 40, 50 years um, after the 1920s. 
So he also did a lot to propose laws on promoting African American rights, and, and he's a big proponent to making sure that um, they had every chance to contribute positively to American society, and that's and that's the opportunity he wanted because these African Americans are native born Americans; they're not immigrants; <clears throat> so they are native to this land. All right, there there are reasons for, but but not African Americans don't really have this nativist belief because obviously they look different. So you know, it's just. It became very different understanding of way of living for African Americans. Um, but Harding saw African Americans as a native culture, and they should be allowed to uh, contribute positively. Um, in 1923, Harding goes on a railroad trip up to Alaska. In fact, in fact, Harding is the first president to visit Alaska. On his way back, he gets sick and he passes away um, in San Francisco. When, and when he passes away, um, his legacy is known to be pretty untouched. He is someone who has had some scandal involved in his administration. Like There was a story where um, uh, a woman claimed that Harding had relations with her and, and they had a, had a child that was, that was her son. I mean, that, that was his son, excuse me, that was Harding's son. Um, illegitimately while Harding was still married to his wife. So, I mean, the scandals came out, the reports came out. Um, Harding wasn't really attacked too much for it because there was no evidence to support it. Um, plus, he's a politician, he's a president, so he can silence whomever he wants to. But at the same time, he wasn't removed from scandal within his own administration, even after he died. Now, <clears throat> he made some pretty good choices about cabinet members and in, in the big positions, but he made very poor choices in those that are not as important to the daily you know, existence of America in, compared to the world. Albert B. Falls, one of those people that was a poor choice. He is Secretary of the Interior. His job as Secretary of the Interior is to monitor all national parks throughout the entire country. Anytime there's a park or a resource or a wildlife refuge, anytime that, that it, any land that is protected by the government, that's going to be the Secretary of Interior's or the Department of the Interior's responsibility to keep that going. In fact, if you go to um, any national park and you get a map, if you, I'm sure you'll find somewhere on that it says, um, Secretary, uh, I mean, uh, Department of the Interior, and have the Secretary on that. Albert B. Fall at this time is Secretary of the Interior. Well, there are some main oil lands that have been dis recently discovered, and they are set off to be reserved for Navy use. The Department of the Navy, under Taft, received these oil lands as to be used for reserves, just in case in times of war, so the Navy can, you know, Dig, you know, dig up that oil, they can refine it, they can turn it into fuel, and they can power their ships for however long they need to, and that's, that's what the reserves are for. And under Harding, he decides that the Navy doesn't, you know, absolutely need that oil immediately, so we're going to transfer departments. It's going to go from the Department of uh, the Navy to the Department of the Interior, um, which obviously deals with all natural resources in the United States, so it makes sense that it goes there. However, Albert B. Fall, when he gets this land, he begins to sell it off to the high, to the um, to anybody that's willing to pay. Such, he doesn't even allow competitive bidding for this. Like no, Normally under circumstances, you'd allow companies to come in and bid for this land. It becomes very public, and, and, and people know that it's happening, and then the government gets the money. Well, that didn't really happen in this place. Albert Fall, who is Harding's close friend, accepts payments from private oil companies to lease the land that the oil is on so they can give companies those rights to drill on that sanctioned oil land. The problem is when Albert Fall accepts these payments, he doesn't give it to the government, he puts them in his own pocket. So over the time, over the course of 1920, you know, 1921 to 1923, Albert B. Fall becomes a very, very, very wealthy man because he's selling off this oil, which is a very hot commodity at this time because it's a new fuel source um, for, to oil companies to drill, to, to refine, and then to turn into fuel for the general public. Albert Fall takes that money, puts it in, into his own pocket. Um, now, there was no knowledge or recollection that Harding was involved in this scandal. However, um, people like to speculate that Harding might have had something to do with it because maybe a stress that might have led, um, that might have led to him to his uh, declining health on his trip out to Alaska, which when he died in 1923, this is what people mostly assume, that the stress might have led to it. There's no evidence to support that he knew anything about it, but maybe the stress caused from it um, was something that he... he uh, he probably died from. So um, this scandal is something that is very, very, uh, you know, important to look at in American history because it is one of the worst scandals in U.S. history. It doesn't happen a whole lot. You know, it, we don't see it a lot in the books. It is there in our textbook, but like, there's not a whole ton of you know, different ideas behind it as to why it was such a bad or, or even a even a good thing. And it's not even a good thing. Just the fact that we have one corrupt politician taking money, um, putting it in his, into his own pocket, and then, you know, trying to live out his life afterwards. The problem with the Harding is. All these investigations into Albert Fall after, you know, after this, this scandal, or after, you know, he leased the oil lands, this all happens after Harding dies. So, 
Albert Fall is judged. He's sent to prison as a cabinet member. He's one of the first cabinet members in history to be ever to be sent to prison. And then Harding begins to, you know, actually Harding can't wonder because he's dead. So the people begin to wonder how involved were Harding, was Harding into the scandal. And Harding's not even alive to defend himself. So yeah, this is really, really damning for Harding's um, his legacy as president of the United States. He wasn't the best president. He wasn't the smartest guy in the room. But people enjoyed the kind of glad hander that he was, shaking people's hands all the time, you know, smiling, patting people in the back. He had some. He he, he fell to a victim to some vices every now and then, gambling, drinking, smoking. But at the same time, um, his biggest probably guilt is the fact that he put some pretty bad people in the in a pretty powerful positions within Washington, specifically Albert Fall, Secretary of the Interior. Now we go into Coolidge. Coolidge is pretty simple. Um, he was not involved in Teapot Dome accusations. In fact, many people claim that he restored dignity and prestige to the presidency. Um, he wins the election in 1924, a year after Harding's death, and he runs on the slogan, Keep Cool with Coolidge. Now, I'm going to go through this kind of quick. That way you guys can see this. If you need to pause this video, now is the time to do that. That way you can get some of these notes. Um, he also believes in a hands-off approach on laissez-faire um, government, meaning the best the government could do was to leave business alone. It's not meant to take businesses and try to regulate them and make them pay extra money so they can you know, fall into government you know, plans or fall into government um, uh, regulations. Um, if we leave businesses alone, we make them spend less money on regulations, then we can have them make more money, and then the expectation is that they use that extra money to pay employees more or to hire more employees, um, and, and thus the workforce becomes more positive as a result. Congress supports this approach um, that Coolidge takes, and they pass laws to make it happen. In fact, in Coolidge's administration, he doesn't, um, he doesn't not only lowers taxes once, but he lowers taxes twice during his term as president. He takes uh, Harding's the rest of the term, and he does one full term himself um, to, uh, as president of the United States, and he lowers taxes twice within that five-year period, which is remarkable. All right. He is also very tight with the government's money, hence the reason why he's dropping taxes, because he doesn't want to, he wasn't, doesn't want the government to have a lot of fiscal power um, around around the country. He wants the states and the, and the businesses to lead that way. Um, it gets so bad that when the Mississippi River overfloods due to heavy rains, those flood victims ask for federal aid. The states especially ask for federal aid around that area, and he denies those flood victims that money. So again, not a cool guy when it comes to money, especially when people desperately need it through natural disaster. Um, so something to think about there with, with Calvin Coolidge. Now, his foreign policy is something that is um, not very well known, but the most thing that he is taken known for is, is the idea of the kellogg brion Pact. Now, his Secretary of State, Frank B. Kellogg, made most of the foreign policy decisions. Calvin Coolidge just signed off on him and said, okay, I agree with you. I, I trust in your decision-making. I trust in your reason. Let's go forward with it. And Kellogg, along with the Frenchman Brion, they signed a pact that um, signed by 15 nations, and that who agreed to never use the threat of war in their negotiations. So this is a big deal when it comes to um, uh, the future of war, to make sure the countries never use that threat in, in negotiations. That way war will not really happen. Um, as the foreign policy goes throughout, again, not very active in foreign policy, but Kellogg makes all, the, all those decisions, and this is a path that is signed under Coolidge's term. In the 1928 election, Coolidge decides to step down. Uh, Her uh, Herbert Hoover runs for election and wins the White House by a huge margin because Americans believe under Hoover, who was also a Republican, Americans believe that prosperity would continue. And that is what Americans suspected. Little did they, know, did they know a year later that the economy would completely tank with the crash in 1929 that would lead eventually into the Great Depression. All right, so these are the notes for today. This is all we took care of today at this point. So if you have any questions, please don't be afraid to get, get a hold of me and let me know. But again, the YouTube videos are here. Uh, have a fantastic day. See ya.